Henry the Eighth, and the head injury itself. Even though this isn't didn't affect his personality, as you say, how he was out for quite a long time, wasn't he? If you're out for any longer than a few minutes, it can be really traumatic. But it was only one report, and it was a foreign report that stated that he was KO'd for two hours. Eyewitnesses in England on the ground made no mention of this two-hour unconsciousness. So there's reason to doubt he was even really knocked out for a lengthy time. Interesting. Foreign propaganda again. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. And this week we delve into the greatest myths of the Tudor period. As you heard at the top there, one of them is that Henry VIII was knocked out for around two hours. I don't know if you've read Wolf Hall or seen the superb adaptation, but Henry is shown as down and out long term. But as historian and novelist Stephen Vera Penn reveals, it's nefarious foreign rumour mongering. There's plenty more myths we cover, 10 in total, with a bonus thrown in. We talk Mary Queen of Scots, Elizabeth I, Henry VIII of course, Anne of Cleves and Anne Boleyn. I've got plenty more content upcoming, including a chat on the history of Berlin with its historian, Barney White Spunner. Our film club is coming up with a bonus double bill on successive weeks this month, covering the 2008 financial crash starting on Tuesday. We're just past the 15th anniversary of the crisis beginning with the fall of Bear Stearns. So we start with a big short and the following Tuesday with Margin Call. Please do rate and review and do tell people who'd like the podcast. It's the best way for it to grow. But in the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking with Stephen Virapin on Greatest Tudor Myths. Welcome back, Stephen Virapen, to the pod. It's a pleasure to have you back. And we are here to talk about the top 10 myths of the Tudor period, or top 10 Tudor myths so is a better, a snappier title. Yes, thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah, well, <laughs> so we're doing this and it comes at a fortuitous moment because you've got your sequel to the first novel you wrote of Blood Descended. This one is of Judgment Fallen. So the John Blank mysteries continue. And so when did the novel come out? I think two two weeks ago, I think it was. Now. It was either two weeks or three weeks ago. It was the start of March anyway. So, oh yeah, oh, God, we're near the end of March now. So it was the 2nd of March. Great stuff. And John Blank, who's the son of the Henry the Eighth, Henry the Seventh, and Henry so the Eighth. Anthony Trump. Blank, who's the son of the real John Blank. Yeah. Oh, I, unforgivable. Anthony Blank is the son of John Blank, of course. So he's the black trumpeter of Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth. That's right. Yes. Nice one. Okay, well, let's crack on with the top ten Tudor myths, and um, we're going to go ten to one, and <laughs> we're going to kick off with. The strange tale of Anne Boleyn and her sixth finger on, on her right hand. And is this true? It's a myth. It is not true. It is absolutely not true. Um, the idea that Anne Boleyn had six fingers on one hand is one of those things that's kind of entered the public consciousness and entered into folklore almost. Um, a bit like the idea that Anne was accused of witchcraft and charged with witchcraft. We, I, I, don't ask me why I was watching this, I, I regret it. Um, the TV show they did on Netflix about Sabrina the Teenage Witch, it, was a, it wasn't the 90s thing, it was the, the new I one. I remember it from the 90s. It and wasn't it kept, the 90s. Uh, well, they re remade it or done a new adaptation. Oh, I see. <laughs> and um, it kept referencing Anne Boleyn as one of these historic witches or historically someone that was accused of witchcraft. No, I, yeah, that was my expression as well. <laughs> and she never was. But the idea of the extra finger, um, I don't know why, I have five fingers, I don't know why I'm looking at nine. Um, my niece has had six fingers. Oh, really? Had a tiny little, tiny little sixth finger when she was born. Hmm. Like the sort of vestigial... Yeah, right on the end of her little finger. It was a bit weird, to be honest. <laughs> oh, that's, that sounds cute. <clears throat> But the idea comes from people that were intent on badmouthing and, and associating her with witchcraft and the sinister and all this. And in the period, 
physical deformity was meant to be a sign of inner corruption. So if you had, I mean, the description of her by the guy who came up with the, so I'm concerned, came up with the sixth finger on that hand was Catholic polemicist. And he was writing decades after Anne's death. And it wasn't just the extra finger. She also had a projecting tooth and she had a large vein on her neck. And he describes this. So I, I saw it described on Twitter. He describes Nanny McPhee as Anne Boleyn. And for a time in the 1520s and 1530s, everyone was looking at this woman. Everyone was describing her, talking about her looks, her appearance, her personality. And no one thought to mention this supposed deformity or any of these supposed deformities. So it was made up, it was an invention. But where it gets muddier is that another writer who, again, lived long after Anne's death and wrote, sorry, long after Anne's death, claimed, oh, well, there might have been an extra little show of a nail on one hand. And that's led quite a few people to think, oh, maybe there was something in it, maybe, um, there was a, a double nail or something like that. But as I see it, he was responding to this infamous description of the extra finger and everything. And what he seems to have done, I think, is try and meet it halfway. And all that's done is give it more oxygen. All that's done is sort of inflate the idea that she had this extra finger, that there's something odd about it. And it, you see it in film, you see it in uh, depictions of Anne where she supposedly wears these long sleeves to hide this and wears a high collar to hide the strange neck. Um, but it's nonsense. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> really, it's it's this religiously motivated and also and then also probably slight misogyny going on there because she was an intelligent, fiercely intelligent woman, really. Yeah. Ultimately, this is the reason, isn't it? Yeah. And there was a kind of running battle between people who saw her as a proto-Protestant martyr and therefore to be elevated, and people who saw her as the cause of the Reformation and therefore to be denigrated. So she was kind of, her image became a battleground. Really. Well, it seems like today we are seeing her image being certainly reformed in the last 20 or so years. She's coming okay. through. Yeah. 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 People love Anne. I love Anne. Really. Yeah, I, 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 I like her actually. Yeah. I, I, I probably succumbed to, to propaganda when I was growing up you know with probably that movie henry VIII and his six wives from um 1972 where gets so many things right so many things are good henry VIII, keep Michelle, brilliant but it shows Anne sort of hurriedly hiding her extra finger and and being you know having all these these things and what's strange about it is that was made after the series with keith michelle as henry VIII which didn't lean into these myths. It, it didn't show these sort of silly things. And then the movie came out and everything was suddenly sensationalised and, and all the myths were shown. It was odd. I don't know why they did that. Well, if we want a proper depiction, then it's got to be Wolf Hall then. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wolf Hall and it's um, Claire Foy. Claire Foy, yeah, she's yeah. excellent. Okay, great. So that's, uh, that's that one dealt with, number 10. Number nine, Henry VIII. A, he had syphilis. 9A, he had syphilis. 9B, he his personality changed after his jousting accident. Yes, I was kind of cheating there again, trying to squeeze as many myths as possible into one entry. The first one is kind of fallen out of favour. You see it in biographies of Henry right through the 1980s, the idea that he, he had syphilis or might have had syphilis, but it's not really that widely believed anymore, I don't think. But for a long time, it did circulate as a theory and this was supposedly um why he had mental health problems why he was so ornery all the time i would be too if i was crumbling away with syphilis <laughs> but there's no record of him being treated really for syphilis uh, there is his symptoms and he had many many health problems aren't really consistent with what we know of, of syphilis so it's, it's been largely discounted but the head injury one is more recent as a theory, and it's been given such airtime that it's now almost just quoted as fact. Oh, you, you see, it yes, I was talking to a novelist who said this. Yeah, it's just presented as fact. Oh, he had a terrible accident in 1536, which he did, and his personality completely changed afterwards. And the problem there is that he was quite happy to execute people, to be egotistical, to, to be the Henry that we recognise before that accident. Um, 
he didn't try, I mean, when Henry VIII started being the Henry VIII we know or kind of recognise, you know, the, the tyrannical figure. Psychopath, I think you've called him. Yeah, and, and I stand by it. <laughs> Can never remember what the difference is between a psychopath and a sociopath. So Body she, count, probably. Yes, probably that's the only dividing line, yeah. When he changed, if he changed, I, don't, I think it was always there, the capacity was always there. But what happened that really spurred on the, the infamous Henry VIII was, for the first time, he wasn't getting what he wanted. So there was an obstacle in his way. Through a lot of his reign, particularly the early part, yeah, he might not have seemed that bad. He was getting what he wanted. He was No one was standing up to him on policy issues, particularly on, on anything like that. It's when the, uh, the great matter arose, he really kicked a hornet's nest and there was opposition and there was a lot of grumbling and disagreement and that really brought out the, the tyrannical Henry. That's, uh, Henry could never be wrong, as I think you, you said before. And uh, at that time, people were starting to tell him he was wrong or arguing that he was wrong. That's what caused the monster. We, we don't need to look at a head injury for it. And the head injury itself, even though this isn't didn't affect his personality, as you say, how, he was out for quite a long time, wasn't he? No, that was reported. It was reported, and again, it's quite often stated he was knocked out for two hours, which is serious. I think if you're, um, I'm, I'm not a medical person, but I think if you're out for any longer than a few minutes, it can be really traumatic. But it was only one report, and it was a foreign report that stated that he was KO'd for two hours. Eyewitnesses in England on the ground uh, made no mention of this two-hour um, unconsciousness. So there's reason to doubt he was even really knocked out for a lengthy time. Interesting. Foreign propaganda, again. Right. And it could even just be misreporting as well. Is that stories, I think, if you travel hundreds of miles, they become skewed and stretched, especially if people reporting them weren't there to, to correct them. Indeed, indeed. Right, well, we'll move on. Anne of Cleves, who always, I'm always very sympathetic to Anne of Cleves. She gets a terrible press and all because I guess this nickname she has is the Flanders Mare, not very flattering. And I guess that speaks to her reputation as being a bit, bit. Um, how, should we, how should we say? I don't want to be accused of being uh, misogynistic <laughs> in any way, but not particularly attractive. Yes. Um, I always remember in the Antonia Fraser biography of the Six Wives, she has a preface where she says she was at a gallery and there were some schoolgirls looking at portraits of Henry's wives and they stopped in front of one and one said to the other, oh, that's the ugly one. And the other one said, oh yeah, she's dead ugly. And it was a portrait of Anne Boleyn they were apparently standing in front of. Um, but yes, it, Anne of Cleves has gone down in history infamously as being the ugly one, the the Flanders mayor. And again, that, that movie, that 1572 movie, Henry says it outright. Says, You've sent me this great Flanders mayor. She wasn't even from Flanders. <laughs> but um, it fits the narrative that for a long time dominated, which was Henry met Anne and in this first meeting, he was so repulsed and disgusted by her physical appearance that he um, immediately wanted out of the marriage. He immediately sought means to undo it. But that's us actually, I think, falling for Henry's propaganda at the time. I, we have to remember as well, Henry was no magazine cover at this point in his life. He was grossly overweight. He stank. He, uh, he was an unpleasant and scary physical presence. But the entire marriage was arranged as a political match. It was Henry was seeking allies amongst the um, Protestant princes of Germany. And uh, that alliance had become outdated even when he met him. So he he was looking again to, to Catholic alliances even when she arrived. So he, he wanted out of the marriage. And he seems to, have, what I think happened is he seems to have cast around for various reasons for it. One of them was, she's not a virgin. Uh, he, he came out with that. She's not, I, I felt her breasts and they're loose and she's not a virgin. That didn't work. She's ugly, physically unattracted to her. And that kind of almost backfired because then he had to admit, oh no, I'm still sexually capable, just not with her. So that didn't really work either. So eventually they, they settled on the idea of a pre-contract. Oh, she's, she was already married to someone else legally, so 
we'll have to have the whole thing annulled. That worked. So he was able to annul the marriage and adopt her beautifully as his sister. And then they seem to go on relatively, relatively well. Um, but yeah, so what really stuck, I think, is the she's ugly one. It just seemed to appeal to people. And again, it, because it makes for an easier story than talking politics. And, and it makes for this kind of comic image of Henry meeting her and her being comically disfigured, covered in pock marks and things. It's just an easy story to sell. doesn't matter that it's not true. It was just a, an attempt on his part to undo this. Now, I do think he would have stuck with the marriage if he had met her and been absolutely entranced by her. But um, he doesn't seem to have, he seems to have let the politics when he wasn't interested in her physically. They had very little in common and he just was happy to, to see the marriage go. So he went ahead with this plan to undo it. It's a shame we don't know what, or maybe we do, what Anne of Cleves thought of Henry VIII's appearance, just to level well, it up. Yes, we, we don't know, but what's strange is there's a report from several years after, after Catherine Howard was executed, where um, she supposedly thought, oh, he might take her back now. So they, obviously there wasn't that much of a barrier, if that's true, that um, not much of a barrier appearance-wise on either side. She also reportedly claimed she was much prettier than Catherine Parr, which I really hope that's true because it's, it's very human. <laughs> you know, uh, secretly. Rivalry amongst the wives. Yeah, yeah. That, that um, another woman, a less attractive woman, might take that crown. Wonderful. Uh, right. Well, that's resolved. Number seven in our top 10 of Tudor myths. And I like this one. This is Mary, Queen of Scots, invented marmalade. Yes, um, or it was invented for her by her physician, supposedly. This is a very old story, one of those kind of cutesy stories. But I like it that when she was travelling uh, on board ship between France and Scotland, she fell ill and her physician had to quickly whip up a remedy, which was sugar syrup and oranges and uh, because everyone on deck was saying Marie and my lad, it was corrupted into marmalade for Mary. And uh, this concoction supposedly became marmalade, what we have today. It's completely made up. So I, I'm almost sorry to see this one is completely invented because it's nice. It's one of the few nice myths, but it's nonsense. Marmalade as a word um, comes from the Portuguese originally and it predates Mary Queen of Scots. Even I don't know where it came from, though. I'd love to know where the story Because well, it's from. got to be Seville Oranges, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, said, I don't know how this myth arose, but someone at some point must have just thought it was sweet. Not marmalade, but the story, Mary and my lad. Well, each January, my mother makes marmalade. I love Yes. Is it? I take it as good, fresh. Oh yeah, I've like... got a massive jar of it actually that I dip into. Um, yes. So I have a huge supply of marmalade. I, it never goes short in my house. Excellent. I'm jealous. Very, very good with sausages. Oh no! <laughs> I like marmalade on toast with butter. Oh yeah, I do too. But I, I would recommend this to listeners. Just worth trying marmalade with sausages. You've Don't got... knock it till you tried it. Right. Number six in Tudor top 10 myths, black teeth. Now, I remember when I was a, a, a young boy watching an advert, I think it was for a history magazine, and it was talking about Queen Elizabeth having black teeth. So this is apparently a myth. Well, Queen Elizabeth did reportedly have quite a few bad teeth and missing teeth in her old age which would make sense because she loved sweet things and there was no great dental care or anything like that but the myth which I've come across and I I don't want to say it was the horrible histories books but it might have been it was definitely children's books that I was reading when I was a little history addict and it was reported in several of them and the myth was middle class Tudors would purposely rub soot on their teeth to try and make them look black, to make them look rotten, with the idea being they want to appear for their neighbours and for the rest of the world 
to be rich enough, to out as rich as Elizabeth, that they can be eating these sweet treats that are rotting their teeth. So it was fake black teeth is the myth. But no one, there's no report of anyone in Tudor England falsely blacking up their teeth that I've ever come across. It was apparently a Japanese custom in some places until the early 20th century where it protected the enamel and it was actually considered a, a beauty thing. But, um, women would blacken their teeth artificially, but never in Tudor England. So it's just one of those weird little false facts that seems to have made its way. And I think because it appeals to children, the idea of people blacking their teeth, rubbing soot in their teeth, it often pops up in children's history books. Uh, so linked to this, I think I said, did I say that was number seven? This is number six. Linked to this is number five, I think, which is lead paint being painted on the Virgin Queen. Oh, yes, this is my hate because it, this is, of all of these, this is the one that probably is still really widely just accepted as fact. It's absolutely believed. People don't question it. Historians quite often just state it as, as fact in her old in her later years Elizabeth was in inches of white lead makeup some people even take it further and say oh this caused her to go bald it caused her teeth to fall out it, this was behind it all it caused her to have mental problems some people have argued the problem is there are no accounts from eyewitnesses who saw Elizabeth that she was ever coated in thick white lead makeup it comes from the Victorian period when we started to say that she used Venetian cirrus. Now, this did exist in Elizabeth's day, but it was often associated with Italy, I guess from the name, and no one ever in Elizabeth's day claimed she used it. We do, I think, or we can be safe in saying she probably did use cosmetics, but if you look at the cosmetics, the English cosmetics that were contemporary to her, they weren't Venetian cirrus, they weren't this white toxic lead. They were sort of exfoliant things. They, they probably wouldn't have smelled very nice or been used very nice, unless rose water or something was added to them. But the idea that we, we see, particularly in Elizabeth R and the movie Elizabeth, Kate Blanchett. Um, Elizabeth R, is that the one with Glenda Jackson? Yes, and it's fantastic. It's, it's my favourite depiction of Elizabeth ever. But in that final episode, there's just this point. If I remember right, and I, I could be remembering incorrectly, it starts with her looking in a mirror. I mean, she pulls the mirror down. She she's a clown. She from the from the top of her forehead right to her fingertips, she is whitewashed, like dipped in whitewash with these red cheeks and red lips, and it's just like Pennywise the dancing clown makeup, and. That has really stuck in the imagination. So even in that 90s movie, Elizabeth, it ends with her being painted white. And it just, there, no one said this in her day. And lots of ambassadors reported on her appearance. Some would talk about how thin her lips were, how many teeth she had missing and on which side. So they were commenting on all kinds of things. And none of them thought to ever say, oh, and she was dipped in whitewash. Because she wasn't. There's no evidence that she was at all. So... The most true, the truest depiction of Queen Elizabeth on screen is Miranda Richardson in Blackadder. Then. Queenie, yeah, Queenie got it right. No, no toxic white lead makeup. Uh, I actually think if you ever saw the um the Helen Mirren miniseries, they are quite sparing in making her up. They keep her looking fairly natural. I think that's probably closest to the truth than the um the Glenda Jackson old Elizabeth. But yeah, Queenie. Queenie News. I'll have to do at some point a top 10 screen Elizabeths and we'll see where Queenie places. Yeah, we should do that, but gotta be, she's gotta be high up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, num right. So we're in, we're, we, we've done, that was number five, number four. And this is Mary Queen of Scots. And I know you're very fond of Mary Queen of Scots for <laughs> obvious reasons. And this is that she ruled with her heart, not her head. Yes. And she obviously, she lost her head, but you wrote. I was very careless of her. Yes, you wrote a very good piece for us quite recently, our historical heroes slot on Mary Queen of Scots. A similar argument in that she was she was she behaved like a man, like a king, mm. rather than you know 
ruling with a he her heart, which is this sort of accusation. Yes, it's, it's a really common phrase. You, you still see it all the time if you visit um, Facebook groups to do with history or to do with the Tudors or things like that. It's always a comparison between Elizabeth and Mary and the statement. You'll see it somewhere on comments. Mary ruled from the heart, not the head. It's just become such a cliched phrase. So the phrase itself annoys me a little bit, but it's just not true. I don't think, I, and no one was uh, accusing her of this during her personal rule. It kind of came as she was falling and afterwards, or she was falling from power and afterwards, and it really ramped up with the Romantics and the Victorians who loved to counterpose the two queens against one another. And it was Elizabeth cold, calculating, and then as she was elderly, painted white and haunted by her past, he created this Miss Havisham figure for Elizabeth and Mary, tragic, romantic, lovely, emotional princess and all that, and nonsense. Uh, Mary wouldn't have recognised it, Elizabeth wouldn't have recognised it. In her day, she ruled for that period in, in which she was actually resident in Scotland in, in the 1560s. She was uh, tolerant religiously or managed to walk a fine line. She and Marion Darnley certainly wasn't ruled by her heart. Um, she chose him because he was a good political match and she could side, or she hoped she could sideline him politically. Didn't quite work out that way because he turned out to not take too well to being <laughs> sidelined. But the idea that she was just this passion-led emotional wreck is bizarre to me. It, 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 again, it comes from stories, it comes from her life being fictionalised, I think, and linked to it is something very similar. I think of it as the, the kind of Scarlet O'Hara fiction of Mary Queen of Scots, so the idea she was just this emotional kind of um, woman, headstrong woman, and what she really wanted was a big strong man like Bothwell to, to sort her out, and again the truth is not like Bothwell was horrible, he was odious, possibly even raped her. So it's it kind of does a disservice if you simplify things to oh, she was just an emotional roller coaster of a woman. You can disagree, I think, with her political decisions. And as I pointed out in that article, fleeing to England instead of staying in Scotland to regroup and fight her rebels was obviously a bad move politically, but it was a political move just as her marriage to Darnley was a political move. Her marriage to Bothwell as well might well have been a political move in attempting to uh, marry a Protestant. She was Catholic, he was Protestant, and defused some of the um, accusations she was facing that she was intending to turn Scotland Catholic with baby James. So uh, her depiction then, do you think her most recent depiction, I think it is in that in the film, Mary Queen of Scots, is that quite, is that a bit more accurate? Or do you, you not, you're unconvinced by that? I only saw the movie once. I saw it when it came out. I watched it in the cinema. Um, and I, I have to say, I didn't hate it. I didn't. I, I, I thought it was a movie that <laughs> made put that on the movie poster. Steve <laughs> I, I, didn't, hate I it. didn't hate um, it. No, my problem wasn't with so much with the depictions. There. For example, I really like Margot Robbie as Elizabeth. I thought it was really refreshing to see a kind of um, vulnerable Elizabeth, which we don't usually see, uh, even in. Um, Elizabeth R, you didn't see too much of her being vulnerable and self-conscious and all of that. So it was interesting, it was, it was good. And the actresses, both actresses, uh, Saoirse Ronan and Margaret Robbie, both great. No, my problem with that movie, as I remember, it was they forgot to put a story in, really. It was Mary started out in that film as being really modern and saintly and good, and she ended up being really modern and saintly and good. <laughs> so it's like, where was the journey from? What did she learn in the course of the movie? Through all these traumatic things? Not much. I also, yeah, I remember it. It's the movie that had all the denim outfits. So they were going for style, I think. And that might have coloured my view of it. Okay. But what to watch, as I remember, it was different. Well, we're now in the top three. And number three, I'm always interested by the practicalities of life. And this, this myth is quite interesting to that because this is the myth that during the Tudor period, everyone stank to high heaven. Yes. And 
I've seen it applied to the medieval period, probably seen that as well, seen it applied to the Victorians. Seen it, so this is one that pretty much every period that isn't now, there's an idea that everyone was dirty and stank. In the Tudor period, there was quite a lot of washing, um, maybe not bathing, certainly not showering as we know or anything like that, but there were manuals on how to keep clean, there were um, manuals on how often to change your laundry, how often to change your underclothes, and that would keep you relatively fresh, especially if you were wealthy enough to afford perfumes to have your clothes daily brushed and your linens daily changed and all of this sort of stuff. So this was one that I say it's, it's a half myth or it's a myth that's untrue or false, but with some sort of caveats, because with all that said, obviously not everyone could afford to perfume themselves and um, have their clothes cleaned every day and all of that sort of stuff. So I think it would vary very greatly depending on how rich you were, what your um, class or rank was, and it would also vary on where you lived as well. If you lived in an inner city, chances are you would smell quite a bit because the streets might smell, especially what if the, the tide is backing up, what if uh, neighbours are no sewage. The refuse out yet, what if the channels, those sewer channels are clogged, as it smells cling to people. Um, there were bonfires in the street for celebration, there were indoor fires, so smell of smoke would, would cling. So I think the idea that everyone absolutely stank and so that would be disgusting is untrue. But we also can't be too convinced that everyone was adhering to these ideals and the health manuals and things. And presumably there were other forms to keep your keep the smell like I'm speculating here but like bunches of herbs or something to keep you yes I, I will say very famously so women could walk around with pomanders which were stuffed with attached to their dress and stuffed with sweet smelling herbs Woolsey supposedly went around with an orange stuffed with cloves and when he was in the street he would hold it up to hide the foul smells now that wasn't just snobbery there was also belief that um disease carried on miasmas and on smells so it could actually be dangerous to your health if you are inhaling stink and the stink of people and the diseases that were being carried on that stink great so yeah, stuff smelly times but not everyone's stink great stuff right well number two we're at number two and this is that henry the eighth was a warmonger yes this is another myth about the image of Henry VIII and how much of that has been managed and crafted and mutated over time and he's very often associated with Henry V and self-identified with Henry V so people tend to view Henry VIII as this inveterate warmonger that was just constantly seeking war with France particularly war with France um, that he was desperate for glory on the battlefield, that his counsellors would have to try and talk him down from it. being a, a, a hawk, being a war fevered maniac. And it's a half truth. Well, he it's, is a psychopath, isn't he? Yeah, but psychopaths, I suppose, aren't necessarily um, divorced from reality. Uh, and Henry certainly wasn't. I mean, he, he wanted to shape his own reality and in some ways he had the power to do that, which is good for him, I suppose. But um, yes, when he wanted war was on his terms. So he would seek war if he thought it or claimed it was good for England, in other words, good for him and there was a chance of actually winning it and covering himself in glory. But we also find other times when he was actually quite happy, even eager to delay war, put off war, avoid war if he could claim the crown as Europe's peacemaker. So I think what we would have to, can arrive at a middle ground. Henry wanted the glory and you can get glory either by being a great soldier prince or you can get glory by being a great peacemaker and he would go for either. So the idea that he was just always bent on war and seeking war in the continent is a myth, I think. But he was always seeking glory and seeking to make himself a premier player on the continent. 
in whichever form that took, whether it was in a martial form, in a peacemaking form. Of course, yes, the field of the cloth of gold. Yeah, yeah, big. I mean, the piece of it didn't last particularly long, but um, an attempt was made. It's interesting because you've always said to me, or I remember you saying to me that when I asked whether you thought Henry VIII was a good king, you gave a really interesting answer, basically saying that he's almost the ideal of a king, whether he was good or not. Yes, he, he crafted the, the image of a king that we still still really live with, you know, particularly a king of that period, this great, bulky, domineering figure. And he was that. I mean, he was scary and domineering and powerful and just remarkably managed to get almost everyone to buy into this. So I think before Henry, kings didn't seem to have that kind of presence and power. And afterwards, they didn't quite... Elizabeth probably came closest to, or maybe met it, but um, after this period, kings didn't seem to quite have that almost tyrannical ability, ability to be tyrants with, without sort of sparking too many rebellions or anything. And he's helped hugely by Hans Holbein Jr., isn't he? Yeah, so uh, the images, I think, are... Okay, I've probably said this before, I think one of the reasons the Tudors are so popular still is that it starts with those recognisable images. I mean, Henry looks like a, almost a playing card king, kind of the image of a king. And that meant a lot because not everyone would see him or experience him. Most people wouldn't in England, but if there were images that they might see, then that would carry quite a lot of weight. Right. Well, we're now at number one. And if there's one monarch who supersedes Henry VIII in the Tudor period, it's Elizabeth I. Yes. Yeah. But there's a myth about her being a warrior queen. Yes. And I, I, it's a crown, I think, that she would have rejected the idea that she's a warrior queen. Where does the myth, myth come from? I think, again, a lot from cinema and a lot from TV shows, but all deriving from the myth of the Spanish Armada, or at least not, it wasn't a myth that happened, but from the kind of public glorification of the Spanish Armada. You'll know this, it's become, nowadays people would say it's become a meme, um, but the idea of the Spanish Armada being this apex moment in English history with all these images, Francis Drake playing goals and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it was one of those totemic moments that kind of grew in the public consciousness. Even then, even then it was becoming a, a myth in its own time, how great this was, how great England was, how great the Queen was, and the images of her on horseback with a truncheon and a steel breastplate. And um, Elizabeth hated war. Elizabeth was habitually averse to war. She didn't like it. She thought it was expensive. She thought it was a waste of time. Um, but not everyone in her court agreed with her. And I think in the 1580s, once her days as a sort of, um, prospective bride, which she'd played for years and years and years, once that was over, when she was really past childbearing age, she needed to find a new image. She couldn't be this sort of coy would-be bride on the international stage. And she was almost then forced into this new role, which was the defensive warrior queen. And it was stage managed quite a lot by Leicester, um, her, her favourite, her great favourite. And that, I think, stuck that idea that she was uh, this great warrior, when in fact she never saw any conflict, even at the, um, the height of the Armada when she gave her famous speech, the danger had already passed. I mean, the ships were already scattered. So, um, it didn't matter. The image became more important and it, it was inflated in James's reign. James was inclined to peace. He, he really pushed the peacemaker line and that led to comparisons with Elizabeth. So you find people, particularly later in the Jacobean period, say, you know, remember when Elizabeth was queen and we were at war with Spain and wasn't it great? And then we had a, a real sort of warrior in charge. James is just peaceful and passive and all of that. So it became, again, a political image, this image of Elizabeth as a warrior. 
But I've said this again, I, I kind of half me because she was feared by the world. Not the, the Pope claimed she was feared by the world, Pope Sixtus, but she was certainly strong and domineering. And um, I think she probably eventually bought into this warrior queen image. So it depends on, I suppose, ultimately, how do you define a warrior? Is it someone that is actually out fighting and, and pushing a martial line? Or is it someone that actually succeeds and um, keeps people at bay without doing that? And the speech itself at Tilbury was, as you say, after the Armada had been dealt with. Yes. Is that Although we therefore... didn't know that, though, to be fair, the news sort of filtered in slowly. So, um, and there are several different versions of that speech as well. So we don't know exactly which one she delivered. So she might not have said, I may have the... The, the heart and stomach what? of a king. I think she did. I think that, that recurs in a few of them. So, yeah, I think she did say that. I like to believe she said that. It's a good line. Okay, good. At least that's not a myth. That would have, yeah, I think that that's a bit like the Ravens leaving the Tower of London. If that becomes a myth, <laughs> in trouble. It would take a Scots historian to dispel these myths. Yes, sometimes, sometimes you need one. Um, I know we missed one as well, there, which doesn't even really deserve house room anyway. We could probably sum it up in one sentence. Elizabeth I was not a boy. Yes, I was going to mention that as a bonus. To, I almost yeah. didn't want to. I wasn't going to include <laughs> that because I thought it's so stupid and so silly. Is there anyone that really believes it? Um, have you come? Had you come across that before the? Big I think vaguely, story? but I couldn't. But not 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 as any kind of serious. Um, hmm. Oh, you you will find people that still put it forward and, and claim it's true. But yeah, nonsense. Elizabeth I didn't die as a young girl and get replaced with a boy from Bisley who then lived out the rest of his life as Queen Elizabeth. It's crazy. Is that is that motivated by, again, a bit of misogyny? Is it an assumption that no woman could become a there great is, monarch? There is a bit of that wrapped up in it because people have tried to justify it by saying it's, this explains her intelligence. She was a, she was a man. Um, or this explains how strong she was or how all of this. She was a man. That ex suddenly is solved. Um, so there is some misogyny, I think, baked into it. But my problem with it is I, I can't find anything beyond Bram Stoker in 1910. That's when it was publicised. He would claim it, it was an old myth that everyone in Bisley knew about. I've not seen any evidence of that. I've seen any evidence that it was a sort of centuries-old belief. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe it was. There, maybe, it? maybe it was a centuries-old belief, but that does, still doesn't make it true. Great stuff. Well, that's been wonderful, Stephen. Thank you, listen, Thank listeners. You. I hope you enjoyed that. That's your lot. That's your top 10 to impress people at dinner parties. And then Stephen's new book of Judgment Fallen, which is out now. There's a link in the show notes, along with the article that goes with what we've been talking about today. Stephen, thank you. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much for listening. Now you're armed with the vital information to correct those Tudor myths. As I mentioned at the start, plenty of content coming up, including the history of Berlin and our 2008 Financial Crash Film Club double bill starting Tuesday. Please do rate and review if you can. And until then, thank you and good night.